This is Full Steam, a series that profiles the best and brightest brains from the world of tech, all of whom just happen to be women. My guest today is Helen Dixon, the Data Protection Commissioner. We'll hear how her career started in tech and how her office governs the likes of Facebook. So before we talk about what it is that you do, uh, let's start at what you studied in college and how you got to this point today. Okay, I, I have to warn you, I'm probably classified as a person who believes in lifelong learning, so okay. it's quite a bit that I've studied in college. My undergraduate degree was in applied languages, I did French and German. Then I went on uh, and almost directly after that did a master's in European Economic and Public Affairs in UCD. Uh, and later on, when I started work, I was working in a technology company, I decided to do a postgraduate diploma in computer science to understand a little bit more about the area I was working in and computer programming in particular. Later on, I studied for the FE1s at the Law Society okay. uh, because I was interested in, in law in the area in which I worked. I did a master's in governance uh, and I've done a postgraduate qualification in judicial skills and decision making uh, and other areas of study. So I tend to, as I move on in my career, I, I tend to like to supplement my on the experience, uh, on the job experience with, with study as well. So and it's an you, ongoing process. Yeah, I was going to say, geez, <laughs> how many letters do you have after your name? But uh, are you naturally academic? Do you enjoy the academia? Does it come naturally to you? Yeah, I liked school when I was younger. I, I, I do like studying to supplement uh, on the job experience. So yeah. I think when you can work in a theory based way, you get better outcomes. So so I like both. I'm, I'm academic, but I liked I'm a doer as well. Yeah. And so did you have a vision of what you wanted to, to be when you grow up, I suppose, when you were studying in college? Ooh, when I was studying in college, I was going to say when I was at school, mm. I did the Leaving Cert. I was barely, had barely turned 17 when I did the Leaving Cert. Oh, wow. So I didn't really have a clear idea even of what I wanted to study. And I thought languages sounded glamorous and uh, being a member of the EC was in vogue at the time. So um, that's why I set off uh, on, on that route. No, I didn't really have, have a clear picture. And I, I've worked in quite a variety of different areas. Mm -hmm. I worked for two technology companies for the first 11 years of my career. Then I decided to join the public sector. I came in as the first senior manager, recruited externally at assistant principal level, uh, and I had roles in science, technology, and innovation policy. Later on, I was promoted. I became the registrar of companies. And then in 2014, I decided to apply for the job of commissioner when it became vacant. Wow, okay, so that is a, quite a broad spectrum of experience that you've mm. garnered before you took this role. Um, when you worked in the tech companies, what, what position within the companies were you with it? So the first company I worked for uh, after I graduated was a company that, that at the time was called Worthington Data Solutions. It's since shortened its name to Worth Data. Um, and it was a family owned Californian based company uh, that manufactured barcode readers uh, and had created its own barcode generation software. Um, so true innovators, uh, the founders uh, of the company. Um, and they had decided to open a European operation to supplement the, the uh, US operation that they had. Uh, and initially, actually, they located the operation in Switzerland because they came, visited Europe and thought the mountains and scenery in Switzerland were beautiful. Yeah. Um, and later, of course, they discovered that Switzerland is outside the EU and that it was, it was more challenging to ship products into the EU. Um, so they decided to relocate to Ireland and that's when they recruited me. So I had a very general role as the operations manager for that company. Uh, for the six years that I worked for them, we were a small team of about four to five people. We did everything. We sold on the telephone every day in French and German. I got to use my languages. We did technical support on the telephone on our own products. And then in the afternoons, we packed and shipped the products from our offices in Dublin and shipped them to customers who'd placed orders. So it was a fantastic uh, experience. Then I went on and was hired by Citrix, Citrix Systems. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very big uh, global software company that does enterprise solutions. 
and there I was the Enterprise Technical Services Manager for Europe, Middle East and Africa. So basically I headed up a team of engineers, both remote and on-site, uh, that delivered enterprise level support to very big uh, enterprise clients. And how did you find managing a team like that? It was quite a challenge managing a team that was uh, remote yeah. from me. So I had staff that were based in South Africa in some cases, uh, a lot of staff in Germany. Um, but we actually, because of the type of systems that Citrix sold, we had excellent communication tools and document sharing tools. Uh, and so technology overcame a lot of the uh, obstacles that you'd otherwise have. But it, it, it was challenging and it was also very interesting. And so then what made you leave that role into uh, where you went to next? So I think I hit that phase that, that I've read subsequently that a lot of people in their early 30s hit where, where they think there's some, some greater meaning uh, that they might seek out in terms of their work. And I've read that actually a lot of people at that point turned to being teachers or, or delivering in a role like that. In my case, I, I decided that I wanted, wanted to try delivering public service. Uh, and I was attracted to the type of policy roles that I saw advertised and I thought I could make a difference in, in a public service type environment. Um, and, and so that's why I applied when I saw that the civil service was advertising assistant principal grade jobs externally for the first time, uh, I decided to throw my hat in. And was there a shift going from, you know, the company where you were before Citrix, where you're doing phone calls and then packaging things to Citrix to then suddenly being in an office, very structured <laughs> environment? I'd say it's a bit of a culture shock. You, you can't imagine. I mean, I, I went from a beautiful, modern office in East Point Business Park, where, where we wore jeans every day and uh, we did all sorts of technology, as I said, to communicate. We used a lot of our own solutions in-house and of course it was a global company mm -hmm. to suddenly being in uh, my own office in, in the Department of Enterprise on Kildare Street with, with a large wooden door that was locked behind me as, as I, was, I was ushered in uh, and on a long corridor where from one end of the day to the, uh, the end of it I, I, I saw nobody else. Wow. There was no open plan working environment. There were lots of silence polished corridors so as a physical environment it was enormously different and in terms of the types of technology we use to communicate hugely <laughs> different imagine. as well and then of course as you said the 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 means of working is is considerably different it's a very hierarchical structure um, and and I discovered fairly quickly that even once I'd assessed uh, a policy matter and come to a decision that wasn't the end of it. I had to put it up the line and have two or three people above me say, yes, we agree, we agree. So very, very different. Was that frustrating, again, coming from a place whereby you are all things to all people and you just get on with it? It wasn't so much frustrating as very different and you have to adapt. Okay. So if, if, if you want to make a difference, you have to come inside the system uh, perhaps at the right time give feedback on how you think things could work efficiently uh, and without being obnoxious about it bring in some of your private sector experience and lend it. I mean nobody wants to listen to someone saying all day long when I was at Citrix yeah. we did it this way so you, you had to pick the time to say well look there might be another way of doing that so no I wasn't frustrated I, I, I adapted uh, and I was focused on working within the system, albeit trying to improve it to deliver the results that, that I wanted to deliver. And so w what was your game plan then at that stage when you were in that, did you sort of see yourself staying in that department for as long as humanly possible or did you always have bigger visions or want a new challenge? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly a game plan person and okay. if you ask me now what's my game plan <laughs> yeah. for 10 years time, uh, there isn't one. I, I, I tend to focus very intensively and work hard uh, at, at whatever job I'm doing mm -hmm. and uh, I, I will believe in whatever I am doing and, and what I can deliver out of it. And I think when you're responsible for managing a lot of staff, which I have been for a long time, I've had big teams, if, if, if the leader of the organisation doesn't believe in what they're doing and isn't very committed to what they're doing, then I think it's very hard to bring staff. 
uh, along with you. So I, I had no game plan, but when I saw the job of Data Protection Commissioner advertised, it, it did really speak to me in terms of what the role is about. Uh, that, that idea that we have to use data and use personal data and use it to our benefit, but equally we have to respect the right of each individual to have their personal data protected and where is the balance and, mm -hmm. and how can we justify certain uses of personal data and when should we not attempt to legitimise uses of personal data. So it really interested me uh, in terms of, of where that balance is struck and trying to bring clarity around all of those issues which I've been trying to do for the last four and a half years. And it's really interesting, so since you took up this role, obviously the consumer has become more aware of the importance of their personal data, uh, the protection, the privacy and the controls that they have, but also how it can be misused. Because for such a long time, sort of the trajectory of technology, consumer technology anyway, for, to begin with, has been so great. We just wanted all of the new gadgets, all of the services, take all of my information, I'll take every box, just let me have the apps on my phone. And then suddenly, like I was trying to pinpoint it in my own brain, I do think Cambridge Analytica was a big turning point for people. I agree with you, yeah. Because they sat up going, you know what? Did you, how have you found it sitting in, you know, behind your desk and watching this transformation happen? Well, I think it's all very positive in terms of that greater user awareness of, mm -hmm. of their rights and also their need to be vigilant in terms of handing over their personal data in, in, in different circumstances. So I think the GDPR has been a huge boon for all of us. The timing has been good. It was adopted by the EU in May 2016, as you know, and then came into application in, in, in May 2018. So in the lead up to the GDPR, we saw really positive and massive engagement in Ireland, not just by companies and public sector bodies in terms of getting ready, which is important in terms of how they meet their obligations, but really the public has, has come hugely on board and the media has as well. Yeah. And GDPR is really now a very mainstream topic uh, and, and it's discussed and debated on lots of radio programmes. Um, the, the downside, I suppose, of it becoming a mainstream topic is that some misunderstandings of, of what the law is about have also arisen. Yeah. And some extrapolations of, of the principles have really been taken to some uh, extremes, I would say. Is it good, from your side of things, that uh, data protection is on people's minds now? Because I do think, as I said, for such a long time, we didn't really value our information. We just thought, oh, sure, what are they going to do with it anyway? Oh, I think that's very positive. For starters, in terms of the organisations that are supposed to safeguard our data, mm -hmm. if they don't have that awareness, then there is no compliance. Yeah. Um, and what we find a lot in terms of breaches notified to the office and in terms of issues that arise where complainants come to us and say, uh, this company has mistreated my personal data in the following way, what we find is that frontline staff in organisations often aren't adequately trained to recognise a scenario where they may be about to make an unauthorised disclosure of personal data, where they're failing, for example, to validate the identity sufficiently of a caller and so on. So I, I think increased awareness on the part of organisations that collect uh, personal data and then increased awareness on all of our parts is hugely positive. And one of the things we're seeing with the GDPR is that as organisations have had to publish details of their data protection officer, those organisations are reporting to us that they're getting a lot more complaints filed directly with them uh, by data subjects. In many cases, they're able to sort them out. It's mm -hmm. a data subject seeking access to what personal data the, the company holds on them uh, and the company complies within 30 days. But the, the volume of requests and complaints they're receiving directly now is increasing. And that's showing that accountability under the GDPR is working, that the organisations are forced to be accountable directly to, to those of us that are individuals using the services. What I thought was really interesting, and as I said, it was sort of a perfectly timed introduction here in Ireland because it was in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And suddenly you were hearing GDPR from the mouth of the likes of Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, and they were citing it as an example of data protection done well. I think there's their sentiment towards it has they might have warmed up a little bit because uh, obviously they're, they sort of uh, operate and value data greatly. But 
Do you think that we are going to see more of the tech companies who are US based uh, adopting elements of our GDPR? So I, I, I think Cambridge Analytica certainly contributed uh, in, in terms of the example you gave of Facebook to an understanding on their part mm -hmm. in terms of the public reaction they saw uh, to that, that they had to do better in, in data protection terms and communication terms. But I think it's not the only uh, event that is driving US companies now to talk up GDPR and to talk up the benefits of GDPR and the fact that it's a pan-European law. Mm -hmm. um, really, I think one of the big drivers of that narrative now is the fact that Washington is looking at the potential of introducing a federal data protection law in the US. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, California has gone ahead and legislated with the Californian Privacy Act, which is going to come into effect in January 2020. And now other individual states are looking at introducing laws. And so those US companies uh, do not want a scenario where there are 50 different state yeah. laws in the US that they have to comply with. Uh, and so now a lot of them are talking about the benefits of the GDPR and one uh, horizontal law that uh, would cover all of, of, of the states. So there are lots of different reasons, I think, why the GDPR is, is in vogue at the moment. But also rightly so, um, it's, it's a very strong law. It's a state of the art law mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of the thinking behind it. You'll know that it's cleverly designed to be technology neutral. It's, it's high level and principles based. So it really can stretch to cover any scenario, any sector. Um, and uh, I, I think in that sense, it is worth uh, any policymakers and lawmakers studying it very carefully in terms of what it can deliver. And did we need to have a European wide GDP or like, was there a massive leap from what we had in terms of data protection in Ireland? And are we that bit more protected given that it is an EU wide initiative? So I think we did need the GDPR. There was actually an EU-based law already in force. It was the 1995 Data Protection Directive. But because if, if, if you know anything about EU law, the directives have to be transposed into member state law in each individual member state. So they don't have direct effect as laws. You, you take the directive and you transposed it. Um, and so what that meant with the 1995 Data Protection Directive, and the reason you would assume it was an Irish law, is that it was transposed in very different and varying ways in the different member states. Uh, and it led to huge fragmentation over the years and really very varying standards. Mm. Uh, and the issue, of course, with that is there isn't a level playing field for organisations. Uh, there isn't a common digital single market in the EU, which affects... Uh, the economy in the EU, and then also in terms of, of the delivery on, on the right of individuals. It, it was happening in very varying ways in the member states. So there was a need for the GDPR. There was a need for a, a regulation that has direct effect and applies in exactly the same ways in the different EU member states. Uh, and, and there was a need for a law that has brought in very strong enforcement powers for data protection authorities. Uh, that threat that now hangs over all organisations that if they misuse and infringe, they may be subject to very serious sanctions, including administrative fines. I, I think the point had come where that is necessary to drive home the message mm -hmm. that uh, protecting personal data is, is not a, a, an optional extra. It's, it's, it's a core requirement uh, in any organisation. Yeah, and it is any organisation, it's not just tech companies, it's everyone and anyone that has any sort of information. Uh, absolutely, you might be interested to know that um, a majority of complaints that our office receives, leaving aside the internet mm -hmm. uh, companies, a majority of the complaints we receive are against retail banks and telcos. So uh, a huge amount of individuals contact us. There are often issues around um, billing plans and their account mm -hmm. uh, and inaccurate information on their accounts and processing of their financial data and their credit cards in circumstances where they've already, for example, cancelled uh, an account during a standstill period, but uh, the company still goes ahead and processes 
um, the uh, credit card information. So a huge amount of uh, complaints to our office don't concern the internet companies and, and you know, as I said, banking, insurance companies, uh, telcos. I think that'll cost us money, basically. We care about immensely. Well, well that's it. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I say. It's, it's very personal to us when somebody yeah. uh, costs us money mm -hmm. in that way. And that often is what motivates us uh, to get up and make a complaint. Technology is ingrained in every single element of our lives now. You know, over the last few weeks alone on Tech Talk, I've been out with the HSC, I've been in schools, I've, you know, spoken to farmers, I've spoken to people from every single industry that you can imagine, and tech uh, in particular is there, and a lot of data then is generated and input into some system. So I can only imagine the, the change that's going to happen to your office in the next two years because it's going to become more and more. Every organisation is a technology organisation now. Every Whether they like it or not. <laughs> yes, every organisation is a data organisation now. I think you did something on uh, wearables for cows. Yeah. I, I, I saw I on one of your, your yep. podcasts. You're absolutely right. There, there is no sector that, that isn't using technology and typically those technologies are more and more processing personal data. And even outside of the sectors, we see individuals in, in everyday scenarios now potentially coming within the realm of being data controllers under mm. data protection legislation where they're using things like dash cams or smart bells on their homes or extensive CCTV systems that may be trained outside the perimeters of their homes. So the technology that is collecting personal data is just all pervasive now. So it is going to get busier and we have to be smart as an office about how we regulate. Uh, even if we grow to a couple of hundred staff, we're already in the top tier of highly resourced data protection authorities in the EU and probably globally at this stage, um, and, and, and rightly so given the role we have. But even if we grow to a couple of hundred more staff, that's still a finite resource in, in terms of facing into what are hundreds and thousands of organisations uh, all processing and collecting personal data in more and more ways. So the ways in which we have to regulate in a smart way are about getting ahead of the curve and pushing out guidance to organisations, publishing more and more case studies that help the organisations that want to comply mm -hmm. understand how we would see compliance looking. Um, we've got to get quicker at conducting the investigations we're conducting when we do find areas that look like an infringement so that we can push out the results of those investigations that will serve then as, as precedential um, cases for other organisations that, that, that want to comply. And as new technology comes on board, so again, you know, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence at the moment. As this technology becomes um, used more and more, as, as the use cases of it increase, do you think that we're going to have new types of data breaches? Or, you know, is the technology going to change the nature of uh, how these breaches happen and then the, therefore the work that you guys have to do in terms of the investigation? I, I think it's not going to be just in terms of breaches. Security is always going to be a big issue mm. and as we've more and more AI applications that's going to become an increased imperative for organisations. I, I think the issues start much more fundamentally with how do you deliver transparency uh, to users when when there's uh, AI algorithms running in the background. Well, that's the big thing, because if you do ask a tech company, you know, how does this work? They'll say, oh, we can't tell you because it's a secret algorithm that is, you know, a billion dollar idea. So there is a lack of understanding or willing to be transparent there from a business point of view, which I can kind of get. Yeah, so what we're seeing is that organisations to comply with the transparency obligations under GDPR, where they're obliged to disclose to us uh, how the logic of the algorithms work. We really need to test, are they supplying us with sufficient information? Mm -hmm. And will that be sufficient into the future? Particularly where we get into machine learning and learning algorithms, where it simply won't be possible in advance to always signpost what personal data is going to be processed and what the outcomes will be. Mm. So uh, I think there's a big role for policy makers in all of this as well, in terms of looking to see, particularly as we get into the era of things like connected cars 
at what additional sort of legislation potentially is going to be necessary to, to sit alongside and bolster what are the rules around personal data processing. You mentioned there about um, security and cyber security. Mm. When we hear of some of the high level uh, breaches, leaks, uh, hacks that go on, what way does the process work? How does your office get involved? How do the investigations happen? And then what happens? Because we only ever really hear the headline. Yeah, sure. And there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just getting hit with the notices every day. So under the General Data Protection Regulation, there's now a mandatory uh, requirement for organisations to report breaches to us within 72 hours of them becoming aware. Okay. Um, and uh, br breaches are anything that poses a risk to data subjects in terms of, of uh, the breach around the personal data rules. So we've had thousands of breaches notified to us since the 25th of May. Some of them have been very low level human error, mm -hmm. uh, wrong bank statement in the wrong uh, envelope sent to the wrong individual. Other breaches notified to us have been systemic breaches affecting uh, millions of users like the Facebook token breach from last September. Mm -hmm. So when a breach is notified uh, to us now, we assess each individual case that's notified to us. We look at how the organization has assessed it itself. We look at whether they plan to notify the affected individuals. Um, and uh, we do our own assessment to see would we agree with the approach that they're taking. Uh, and we look at what mitigation actions that they're taking. How have they identified what the cause of the breach was? What do they plan to do to ensure it doesn't happen in the future? Um, and and uh, if we're happy with the mitigation actions that, we're, that they're taking, we typically close that case pending receipt of any complaints from individuals or any other information that comes to hand about it. In other cases, we decide to open a full-scale investigation into the circumstances, the Facebook token breach being a case in point, where we want to look at whether the security requirements, and there are very specific security requirements under Article 32 of the GDPR organisations need to meet. We want to look at whether they have been met. We want to look at whether the principle of accountability that governs everything organisations have to do under the GDPR is being met and, and, and to what standard it's been delivered. So if it's something very big, we will open an investigation into it to understand it better and to ultimately to decide if there has been an infringement uh, of the GDPR. No company wants to have a hack or a leak or anything like that happen to them. But when it does arise, are they open to your office coming in and doing these investigations? Or is there the fear factor there of, oh God, they might find something else? I, do, I don't think any organisation uh, is delighted when we okay. send them a commencement letter uh, of an investigation. Um, and this is all the more so the case because of the threat of sanctions and administrative fines uh, under the GDPR. Um, so no, I wouldn't say anyone is, is particularly happy uh, when, when that happens. But for the most part, uh, we're getting cooperation from the organisations that we are investigating into, uh, albeit they're not progressing as quickly as we want. Organisations are often asking us for extensions when we put investigation questions to them. Um, and they're raising procedural issues as well okay. with us that are slowing down the investigations in some cases, particularly around the one-stop shop and what information we're going to share with our fellow data protection authorities when they respond to us and so on. It's inevitable because the GDPR is new and it's new for companies that are being investigated as well and, and, and they're trying to cover their bases and understand uh, what the risks are in terms of an investigation as well. So it, it's simply a process I think the bigger companies accept they must engage with. There mm. is no evading it either. I think the big brands are aware, or a lot of the brands now are aware of the reputational damage that can be done. Like it takes a long time to build up uh, a, cons a customer loyalty, particularly now when we have so many choices for pretty much everything. And I do think if you, unless you are the likes of Facebook, but if you are a sort of a mid to big company and you do have 
some form of you know misuse of data or whatever it may be it can be tricky enough to build up the consumer sentiment once again because trust is becoming more and more of an issue today I think. I, I think that is very true and under the 2018 Act when we do come to making decisions in some of the bigger investigation cases we currently have running now we'll be obliged to publish uh, those decisions and any sanctions uh, that we apply and I think that's going to generate its own bad or good publicity for companies depending mm -hmm. on the outcomes of those investigations as well which is going to contribute on the pressure uh, the pressure on them in terms of of delivering on 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 what individuals anticipate they should receive I don't know if you can ans uh, answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What sort of relationship do you have with the likes of the Facebooks and the Googles and the so on? You know, is it an ongoing day-to-day -day relationship, or is it uh, when Helen comes knocking, pull down the blinds? Oh, we, we've we've very very frequent contact with them. Um, I, I would describe it now, particularly post GDPR, as being very much multifaceted. So we have investigators in our organisation in, in respect of, of several of those organisations you mentioned that are dealing with uh, lawyers and data protection teams in the organisations on these statutory investigations that we now have open into very specific matters. Then on the other hand, we may be meeting product managers uh, in those organisations where they tell us we're going to launch something big and new mm -hmm. um, and we want to run by you uh, what the product is going to look like, what personal data is being processed, how we're going to deliver the transparency uh, and get your views. So they may seek to consult with us. Well, that's a good sign, isn't it, that it, they're it, thinking it, about it from it, the outset? It is a good sign. As I say, a lot of companies want to get it right because the GDPR is principles-based uh, there, there is no detailed prescriptive code of, of, of what the standard of transparency must look like. We've mm -hmm. issued a lot of guidance about it. We tell internet companies in particular, don't put it all in one big 100-page privacy notice, make it layered, have click-throughs, have videos as well as text and so on. Um, but still, they can never be sure, does this add up to the standard that... Uh, is anticipated as meeting the GDPR. So they do like to engage, mm. they like to understand, uh, and they like to be pushed to make improvements before they launch the product. They may equally see to consult us on a formal basis uh, under the General Data Protection Regulation if um, they are implementing a new technology uh, where they've been obliged to conduct a data protection impact assessment and they've identified risks in the project that they haven't been able to fully mitigate, mm -hmm. they're obliged to bring uh, that to us, uh, go through the data protection impact assessment uh, with us, discuss the risks, uh, and, and then we will make a decision as to whether it can proceed. So, so that's another facet of the engagement. I may equally then have separate engagement with senior executives in those organisations, um, where, where I plead the message of GDPR, what it's intended to deliver, how it needs to be embedded in their organisations, from product managers to frontline staff dealing with individuals complaining uh, and so on. So it's multifaceted. Okay. I was at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas earlier this year and there was one of the French tech companies, they have this entire hallway and one of them had developed a really smart CCTV system for shopping malls that would scan your face, take a guesstimate of your age, and then as you walk by billboards, ads for products in certain stores that you would be interested in based on your age would pop up. It sounds very kind of like minority report. Very cool, but also a little bit nerve wracking if it was implemented. It would be devastating if it guessed you were old. I did it and it said I was 42. Oh, I was God. devastated. I was 29 at the time. I was honestly heartbroken. But anyway, I will not be using their service. Uh, but I just wonder, again, for those, and this is a hypothetical, so I know you probably can't give me a definite, but if a big shopping mall here was to implement that type of technology, would there have to be the sign saying that we are using this type of technology in store? Or how does that work? Is that something that you always have to toss over? A again, we'd have to look at it in detail. Okay. What you've described typically is probably 
facial detection rather than facial recognition. There's yeah, so no, just know it's Jess Kelly. There's no it's database just a woman. of yeah, yeah. pictures in the background that's identifying you as Jess Kelly. And, and there may be no retention either. Mm -hmm. There's simply a, an identification that you're female, the demographic. I'm 42, and, apparently. <laughs> <That's awful. laughs> um, a, 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 and then an immediate attempt uh, to target you and direct you in, in terms of the store. Mm. Um, so there may or may not then be um, significant personal data issues arising and, and risks in terms of of the personal data, but again, we'd, we'd have to look at it in, in the specific detail. Mm. But the issue that you raise about it being potentially creepy, that's a very relevant issue in terms of, of data protection and what's done with personal data. There um, are two uh, individuals that I quote quite a bit, Omer Tanay and Jules Polonetsky, that wrote a paper, I think it was back in 2014, called The Theory of Creepy. Uh, and in that paper, they look at data privacy issues and, and where the public have decided that that goes beyond the creepy line and that's acceptable. And they also trace through that idea that social norms are evolving all the time yeah. and changing. And I use an example from that paper that they quote, which is um, number ID, caller ID. So they talk about the fact that when that first was introduced as a technological capability in the 1990s. Uh, people thought it was outrageous that they made a phone call to a company on, on the uh, LED display. The company yeah. could see what number was calling. And they felt it was an invasion of their privacy that their number was now being displayed. And now fast forward to today, none of us would answer a call on our mobile if, Unless if, had if the individual <laughs> is identified to us. So in terms of social norms, we've swung completely on that. Yeah. And, and when once we saw it as an invasion of our privacy, now we see it in exactly the opposite terms, that an unknown person trying to contact me is an invasion of my privacy. So there's always that backdrop of what seems shocking to us now in terms of those uh, displays calculating that we're female, what demographic we belong to, um, who knows uh, as the technology mainstreams how individuals will start to view it. Does a lot of this come down to personal responsibility? So you can't take all the benefits of the tech without being aware of what you're signing up to, what you're giving away, and also knowing the fact that ads can be personalised and targeted. You know, when we talk about this on air, people are still baffled by that. I don't put too much emphasis on the personal responsibility okay. point, uh, and, and my office doesn't at this point. Well, I think it's always true that, as in any facet of life, we all must uh, take personal responsibility and try and be as informed as we can be about anything that we're doing. I, I think we're still too much at the point where the odds are stacked against the individual, even the one who wants to be personally responsible. I think there are there is still a lot of work to be done on better transparency, better technologies to allow us uh, see more easily what's been done with our personal data, better protections being implemented. So um, I, th I think that point is always there, but it's not one I would place any emphasis on at this point. Brilliant stuff. I've been so excited to have a conversation about GDPR, so thank you for indulging <laughs> You're very me welcome. and uh, thank you for your time. You're very welcome.